So welcome to this week's rant from the workshop. But before we get going, we've got to deal with the normal parish notices. So, if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button. If you want to be notified when I put stuff on the channel, hit that bell icon. If you want to consider supporting the channel, pop over to Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash the music tech guy. The address will be down, down here. And consider supporting the channel and the production of videos in general. In this time of COVID-19 and coronavirus, remember guys, stay home, stay safe and wash the pinkies. So, in the workshop this morning, tissues, window cleaner, I suppose in the, guy, in the States you call this stuff Windex, but this is a brand in the UK called Mr Muscle, does the same stuff. And you catch me cleaning this monitor. Um, this is an old green monochrome monitor that I got when I acquired the 330, which is funny enough, sitting there on the workbench with me. Laptops here because I've been listening to Genesis. Um, so, just giving this a bit of a scrub with the Mr. Muscle, and for those harder marks, a little bit of isopropyl okay, alcohol. And then it's going on eBay, and somebody who actually wants a green screen mono monitor because they are still in demand, believe you me can take it off my hands. I actually sold something like this a little while back, well, probably about, actually, I said a little while back, probably about six, nine months ago, um, from another uh, purchase. Uh, and the guy was literally just looking for a monochrome monitor. Um, so there are guys out there that want this sort of stuff. But that's not what this week's rant's about. So this video is entitled, What is Behringer Up To? Now, about, I think it was about four weeks ago, and a picture will be flashing up onto the corner of the screen. Behringer, on, the, on their Facebook page, published a picture of the internal layout of a new synth. And when I say the internal layout, what I'm talking about here is they sort of showed a picture of, the, of a synth, but you can't see what the boards are. You can make out that there is a motherboard, a power board, what looks like a contact strip, a modulation, aftertouch, and user interface boards. And they put this thing up on Facebook. And the tag was the first person to identify the correct name of this synth got one for free. So you basically had to have a punt and you may get one. So good luck to the person who actually wins it because I was slow to the draw. So, And to be honest, my guess would be the Jupiter 8 uh, clone that is fabled to be in, uh, developed by, by, by the Behringer Skunk Works. Now, if I look at this picture, what I notice, and I look down here, but it will be up there for you, um, I notice that there are, along the bottom, what look like... 49 keypads. So if this is 49 keypads, that means this is 49 keys, um, which means it is definitely going to be a synthesizer with a keyboard, not a module like we've seen uh, with the Pro 1 and the Crave and a couple of others that have been recently la launched by Behringer. So it's a keyboard. Supporting that is the fact that it looks like there's a modulation wheel and a pitch bend, uh, to the left of the keyboard, and above that looks like there is an aftertouch board. So definitely this looks like a keyboard, it's not a module. Now, possibly this is not a Jupiter 8 clone, because Jupiter 8 had 61 keys, but those blobs at the bottom could be just a red herring in terms of the key bed itself. So... That sort of has me halfway between the two. Now, if you then look at the top, uh, it's along that middle section, sorry, not at the top, at the middle section, on the right-hand side, it's clearly a power board, and that middle piece is clearly the logic board. And I can definitely see what looks like three MIDI jacks. Um, doesn't mean they are MIDI jacks, but it looks like MIDI jacks. Uh, and then followed by 17 what look like quarter-inch jacks. Now... 
if you go and look at the back of the original Jupiter and you include things like CVs and gates, etc., there were 14 outputs or 14 input, 14 input outputs, shall we say. I'm, I'm going to leave it like that. So it is possible that this is a clone of what was original, what the Jupiter was all about. You can't tell what the what was on the user or what is on the user interface because obviously the board is face down. You can't see any detail on the board. Um, you can see some what looks like markings where components will be coming through, but there's no detail there, so you've got no idea. So it's kind of at this point make your own decision. Is this the fabled Jupiter clone, or have Behringer got something else up their sleeve they're going to drop on the market for us? I don't know. The other thing that has come to light recently, and this is another subjective conversation, I suppose, is this week I spotted on the Behringer YouTube feed a video about the history of the OB Oberheim DMX drum machine. Now, for those of you who don't know what an Oberheim DMX drum machine is, A, shame on you, and B, it was effectively the drum machine, with that with the Lindrum, that was heavily involved in production of pop and rock music in the mid to late 80s and 90s. So I say that. So if we go back uh, and look at sort of other drum machines, we all know about the 808 and the 909. They are they were the drum machines that the sort of whole dance electronic music scene embraced and used those machines to generate what we now know as the sort of house, the hip hop, the acid, the, uh, the garage scenes. However, on the other side, there was first the Roland CR7 78, and that drum machine came to fame because it was used exclusively or extensively, should I say, by Phil Collins on the In the Air Tonight. So those hypnotic drum machine drum beats that you hear on that album are generated by this CR78 drum machine. And then along came the Oberheim and the Lindrum. And between those two machines, many of the pop records came from that area going forward had those drum machines on them in some form or another. Either they were there to add fill-in to the, the drummer or they actually just took over the entire percussion track completely and the drummer sat back and twirled the uh, drumsticks. That's probably being a bit harsh, but back in those days, as people have told me many, many times, the drummers for a lot of these bands were very loose and therefore they had to use drum machines to keep the track tight. So, the question really is, why did Behringer do a history of the eight of the Oberheim DMX drum machine? Is this them testing the waters to see if there's any interest for another drum machine, specifically an Oberheim clone or a Lindrum clone? Or were they genuinely interested in doing the history of Somehow I doubt it. Or have they already built the machine and they're starting to see if they can drum up the interest for people who buy a Oberheim clone? Now, given where these machines are in terms of how much they go for secondhand, there is a market. I've said this before, and I don't understand how a lot of the manufacturers have just walked away from this market. There is a market for machines that replicate the functionality and the sound and the feel of those original drum machines. Um, and Behringer has sort of stepped into this market and basically beat, beat the big boys, I would say, at their own game. But the question is, are we going to see another drum machine come out from Behringer to complement the RD8 that we already know is in the market, and I've got one, the RD9, which Behringer again released a video this week, I think it was, um, of their marketing guys testing the functionality of the RD9. We know the RD6 has arrived. It arrived some months ago. So that's the they've covered off the Roland 808, 909, and 606. Would they move themselves to cover off the Oberheim machine? I don't see any reason why not. 
Make your own mind up. Thank you.